Hey y'all, welcome to Geek Freaks. I am Frank and I'm here with Jonathan. Hey, hey y'all. And we have Thomas. Oh, everybody. We have so many trailers and movies and TV shows to review today. Hey. I'm going to start you guys off with a little bit of a surprise. I didn't tell you about this and it's actually posting on Monday across all of our social network feeds. So check it out and give your answers. I want your guys' top three Marvel villains. Comic book, TV show, up to you. I'll kick us off while you guys think this through. All right, so I'm going Magneto. I mean, I'm gonna, it's really good timing for it, of course, but Magneto's just got that right vibe, right? He's he's correct. Like, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm teaming up with me, Magneto, half the time. So that's one of the greatest reasons to love him. Then I'm going to go Loki and completely Tom Hiddleston. He has made this character so cool and interesting, and the Loki series has me so invested in his character that typically is just neat and Thor's a brother. That's basically it. And then lastly, Doom. Doom, or uh, Dr. Doom, sorry, for his potential. He is a leader of a nation, and that is his whole mighty goal is to protect his nation at all costs and to watch him wield science and magic to make that happen on par with anybody and everybody. Uh, I'm a big Dr. Doom fan, and I can't wait to see what they do with him next. Uh, all right, let's go to Thomas. Thomas, your top three Marvel villains. All right, I'm going to start off with my bottom three and my work my way up to my number one villain. Okay. Uh, when you were saying that, you said some of them, but I'm going to stay away from Magneto because where I'm currently at in the, like, the new run of X-Men everything, uh, he hasn't really been a villain. And well, what we're seeing in X-Men 97, he's kind of not a villain. Yeah. Spoiler alert for that. So I'm going to start off with my third place first, which is Thanos. The, uh, Thanos solidified himself across the you know Infinity Saga. I'm sure some people are like, what? How can he be three? But he's three for me. And, and this is why, because number two is Apocalypse. And nice. Apo yeah, that's it. I, th I thought that was a little bit of a curveball in there, but yeah. uh, I dig Apocalypse. Only the strong will survive. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's humans, doesn't matter if it's mutants. Like, if you're not strong enough, get the F out of the way because I'm coming to murk you. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Apocalypse number two and my number one, and I think this was your number one, Dr. Doom. Yeah. My all-time favorite Marvel villain. Motivations are insane. What he's able to do, his intelligence, the mixture of science and magic, uh, the army he has, the army he can create. The, the rage in him, the confidence, like what a great villain, all time favorite Marvel villain by far. Yeah, I fully agree. That's that's a good way to put it out. John, what do you got? All right. I'm making sure to pick different than you guys, even though you've already named some of my favorites. But uh, <laughs> number three, I'm, I'm going to go with Kingpin, uh, mainly because to me, he's like he's like the Batman. He's he's been portrayed well in, in a lot of stuff, but he's like the Batman of um, villains because he's he's a badass able to, you know, manipulate the masses of the city without having any kind of real powers. So no powers and like able to stand toe to toe with like the, on the tiers of other villains that have powers. Like he's just yeah. as cool as villains with powers. So that's good. Right. Move. I yeah. mean, with toe, toe to toe with Spider-Man, like, okay, case closed. Like he's a badass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I kind of would like to see, cause he's like a brute too. He's like, you know, strong fighter. I'd like to see him fight Bane. Ooh. Right, like that would be a good like one. I mean, I, I don't think I think Kingpin would lose that, but still, that'd be a cool uh, one on one. Um, my number two is Venom. He's a, a misunderstood villain and kind of a you know plays the good guy sometimes, anti hero once in a while. So mm -hmm. he's just all around cool, and I like that he has a very clear weakness. Uh, some heroes or very villains cool. like they they don't have limits or they have very vague limits or or you know not. Uh, but his his is very obvious. So. A great point. I like that. I love that. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I mean, there's, I can't think of off the top of my head, but if they don't have, like, like, uh, Thor, Thor's a hero. And I was like, well, what stops him from, you know, owning the, the planet? Like, he pretty much endless power. You know, there's yeah. not a clear, his dad makes him, him feel bad so that he can't yeah, exactly. use Mule Deer. <laughs> Emotional <laughs> intellect is yeah. Yeah, probably his weakness. Uh, okay, and my number one, I think, is going to be Ultron. I uh, love the Age of Ultron, Age of Ultron movie. Uh, and then the, the what if with him was pretty awesome, too. Uh, so I think we should totally bring him back into some other movies or make another... Ultron, uh, dude, is my number one pick for somebody who needs to come back. And not that, mm -hmm. like, MCU did him wrong, but there's just so much more. And the yeah. events afterwards, when Ultron goes to space and comes back, dude's leveled mm -hmm. up. 
And I think if you watch the what if, you get a little hint of how dope Ultron can get when like he's literally the main bad guy essentially for the what if series season one. Mm-hmm. But uh, that is a very good villain. And then they had, um, I think it's, Whatever, I think it's like Robert California. I don't remember his real name. He's from Blacklist. Yeah, but he was the right. voice. <laughs> he's a great, yeah. he's a great voice actor. I'm thinking Alan Shore, but that's another character. That's name. Boston yeah. Legal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Super good, guys. So I wanted to get your guys' opinions on this. Head over to Threads, Twitter, Instagram, and give your opinions on this and let's know what your uh, top three are. Uh, Marvel, man, they know how to make villains. But so does DC. Mm-hmm. That's what comic books are dope. <laughs> For our news this time, we're doing something a little differently. Essentially, we have a bunch of trailers, we have a bunch of reviews, so we're going to use the Wheel of Reviews. And if that was echoey and sounded badass, it's because Frank had enough time to edit that. If not, hi, how you doing? All right, so (laughs) I have the Wheel of Reviews, and then we have the Wheel of who's going to start the reviews. So we could all chip in, but that's it. And then I have also... two wheels? This is literally wheels. wheels of Double fortune. Wheels. It's not wheel of fortune. We got wheels of fortune. Here, get ready for the echo. Get <laughs> Double wheel of reviews. Sure hope I got that Dang. editing in time. We got a bicycle of reviews over here. <laughs> bicycle of reviews. Oh no. And then we have the five minute timer. We haven't busted this one out in a while. This is the five minute timer. And so if it's a trailer, we have five minutes to discuss it. And if it's a movie or TV show, we have 10 minutes to discuss it. This is to keep things moving along. Cause I think me and Thomas could talk about X-Men for another hour and a half. And we better not do that. So, yeah. no, I got it short. in me. Or we could talk about Halo. It might go the other way with it, but let's keep it short. That, we only need five <laughs> minutes for that. <laughs> All right. You guys both ready to go? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. We're spinning the wheel of reviews now. We are starting with Star Wars Acolyte. Okay. All right. And the person who's kicking us off for Star Wars Acolyte is going to be. Okay, so I'm leading us for the uh, Star Wars Acolyte ser- uh, trailer. Here we go. I am so excited for a new era of Star Wars to be introduced to the mainstream. And already we have so many people that are like debating characters that we got in a glimpse of this trailer. So we see uh, a lot of Japanese influence, which I think is super cool because a lot of the Star Wars Knight stuff was pulled from Japanese influence with the architecture, with the fighting style. Uh, We also have Trinity and some really amazing characters. Just today, I put out a TikTok all about uh, Vanestra, which is somebody from the comic books and books that is somebody that has a lightsaber whip. There's a light whip. Mm -hmm. And it is so neat. Right away, we have debates about it. People from like, oh, in Legends, there's already been light whips. And, and, you know, famously, Luke Skywalker fought one. And other people are like, oh, this is bullshit. That shouldn't exist. That's what I want. I want those lively debates about something that's not just like, Oh, they're woke or anything like that, which those are there too. But, <laughs> but yeah, right. it looks like it's going to be fun. And the Jedi are at full power again, which is something I think I kind of missed from the prequels that when the Jedis were just like at full power, I think we, we had a little bit of that prequels and then we never have it again. They're always underpowered. And I kind of just want to see what it's like to have an army of lightsabers rolling into battle like that again. What are some of your guys' thoughts from that trailer? It, it looks amazing. I'm super excited. Like Disney's really putting their money into it. Uh, but I got to ask you the, the light. I know that you're saying there's been debates about this. I've never seen it before until I seen a TikTok you posted about it. But do they not burn through things like a lightsaber does? If it's a whip, it's supposed to grapple things, you know, attached like Indiana Jones. right? So apparently in Legends, it's eventually outlawed by the Jedis. Uh, like in the era that we're at now with like Luke Skywalker, it's outlawed by the Jedis and the prequels. It's outlawed because mm-hmm. it was too aggressive and people would wrap people up with it and then it would just incinerate them in. And so mm-hmm. they have outlawed it because it's because, you know, how, like even Jedis are supposed to not stab. They're supposed to slice mm-hmm. or something like that. You know what I'm saying? They have certain ways of yeah, negating yeah. themselves a little bit. Yeah, you're right about the stabbing. I was just agreeing because that's like more of a Sith thing. It's attacking, yeah. right? Like even yeah. in this trailer, we see Carrie Ann Moss always going to be Trinity. Uh, yeah. She she's very defensive in how she's like countering the girl and everything. But uh, man, lightsaber whips like. I was just excited about yellow lightsabers. Now we got whips in here. This is going to be crazy. Yellow lightsabers, a lot more of them than we normally see. And Thomas, you were talking about how those are normally wielded by the guards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they're by the Jedi Sentinels that would Mm -hmm. uh, guard the Jedi Temple. Um, I think it's basically somebody who is able to understand or have full knowledge of how the force works. There's some Jedi who are, are of course, like more force driven. And there's others who are more uh, militaristic or you know, uh, they have better combat skills. 
So yeah. the Sentinels were the combination of both, thus the yellow lightsaber. So it's going to be really cool to see a whole branch of Jedi who fall into that category because that it looks awesome. Yeah. Do you think we're going to have a full fledged? I don't think we'd have Sith necessarily like a title Sith. I'm not entirely sure where that lands in the canon. But are we going to see the Sith numbers or the dark side numbers be equal to that army of Jedi that we see in the trailer? Or is it going to be the outnumbered uh, dark side as well? Yeah, there has to be a balance, right? That's what I was wondering when we were watching it. You see such a massive, you know, light side in the Jedis. So if, if there is that balance, either somewhere, you know, else in the galaxy that we can't see, there's also an equally powerful dark force, mm-hmm. or there's deep-seated corruption inside the Jedi Temple that we don't see from the surface, but there's actually, you know, people plotting to betray them or something like that. So, I don't know, it'd be cool to... I mean, hopefully we see that there's a balance either they just recently fought to you know bring justice to the galaxy and they killed a lot of the sith and then you know rebirth is happening now or you know it's existing somewhere and we just don't see it yet yeah that's it that'd be that'd be great i i was watching something i don't know if it's true i know somebody out there who's read all the novels and the lore is gonna be like you're wrong idiot but Mm -hmm. uh i saw something that the sith kind of died out uh, like a thousand years before the prequels um, you know, like Sith do, they all wanted to, you know, overthrow each other. There was a massive battle. Um, the Jedi, you know, did what they could. They fought them off. But ultimately, the Sith kind of killed themselves and killed each other off. So one of the Sith leaders at that time created the rule of two, right? Where there's always one, the master who has the power and the Sith Padawan who w- wants the power. And so I'm thinking maybe they think all the Sith are gone. And this is like the rise maybe of of Palpatine or of, of one small sect of like a, a Sith who became a Sith because he got kicked out of the Jedi order. And that's kind of who I think the main girl is. That's the end of our five minutes. Any final thoughts on the acolyte before we move forward? I think it just looks beautiful. I just Wookie got with and, a and, lightsaber. And, and I, and <laughs> I like that they actually filmed on location for a lot of, a lot of this stuff. So that's something new for the Disney plus series. So, all right, guys, that's the five minutes. That's the format. Let's move on to our next one. Back to the Wheel of Reviews. All right, next is the Penguin. And who is kicking us off? Thomas, you're starting us off with a Penguin review. All right. So we're getting Colin Farrell back as that uh, Brooklyn-ish, you know, like, come on, what are you making me see here? Uh, We're getting him back in all his full form. Uh, You know, I don't know who asked for this. Uh, I, I... don't know if we need this yet and yeah it looked pretty good like colin farrell academy award nominee uh love that character that he played and i'm curious to see how they build out the world of the batman more um maybe we get a robert battinson cameo but yeah i I don't know i don't really have too many thoughts i'm just kind of willing to see what they throw out there i'm gonna watch it i got max so what do you guys think pattinson cameo is confirmed by the way he is popping Whoa. up. Okay, well, yep. I'm in now. My yeah. my uh, hype level just went way up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it looks great. I'm excited to see Colin Farrell. I didn't, I knew I'd seen that that image of the penguin before, and I had no idea it was him. And then even after I saw the TikTok about it, I was like, that can't be right. So I started looking it up. I'm like, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm not remembering the actor's name right or something like that. I'm like, no, I've seen him in a lot of movies. He's a good actor. <laughs> and sure enough, that's him. Like, son of a gun. They did, I mean, a lot of makeup. They did good with him. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to see this, really. I, mean, I love that kind of uh, nitty-gritty, kind of down-on-the-street-level, you know, superhero villain movie. And especially, I like these villain, villain you know, movies and shows where we're getting to see, you know, from their perspective, the whole kind of anti-hero thing that makes them understood why they are the way they are. And, you know, you, you like to root for the bad guys sometimes. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. So this uh, this is based off of the Batman, of course, which is Matt Reeves' universe, and I, and I think I favor Matt Reeves' universe really so far. Um, this is off the comic books, basically the Long Halloween, that kind of vibe, <laughs> Year One, that era, um, towards yeah, very dark and gritty. So both those comic books, they have a lot of just like random characters you recognize their names, right? Kind of reminds me of the Gotham series. And mm-hmm. what I want is for the in this Penguin series for him to do little things, and all of a sudden he's like, oh yeah, talk to Zaz about this, or. Oh, that sounds like uh, Enigma's problem, not mine. Like, just drop names for me. And then maybe we get mm-hmm. a little bit, you know, a little bit of a teaser for other characters that we might know in the in the verse. And it's a great way to bring in some characters that are forgotten. 
the old Batman series with Adam West had a character, King Tut, that was a, a villain, and he was a kind of a clownish character, but, but they were all clowns back then. I think bringing in an Egyptian-themed character now would be so freaking cool, because we could do that way better now. And uh, mm-hmm. it's not just going to be some fat guy that's like, I'm King Tut. It's dope. Big it's dope. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that they could just drop in a lot of cameos for me. Yeah, because yeah. I think the rumor is that we're getting hushed, right, in the Batman part two. So, so underutilized, dude. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, imagine they just plant the seeds for that in this. I, I think that would be awesome. But I completely agree with you. Just throw in names that I know and yeah. I'm going to love every episode. Yeah. So Hush, um, the Court of Owls. These are not confirmed. I'm saying like characters that we need. I'm saying like things we need. Hush, Court of Owls and Aziel, I think is how you say it. Um, which I had all Z- the comic books as a kid. Yeah. Zazel? Or is Zazel? that X-Men? Zazel. That might be Marvel. That's He's, from X-Men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marvel. yeah you're right. That's Nightcrawler's dead. Right. Yeah. I'm such a Marvel well, fan. Well, that, Damn it. Let's not get a Nightcrawler's dead <laughs> argument going on. Yeah, but that's the one. That's the one. But um, yeah. So those three characters, though, are, are, and a lot of times they're tied together, especially with the last two. But like, they're just so underused and they're really dope and they really fit the dark, gritty Gotham vibe right the court of owls a rich group of people that are after the wayne family perfect for this type of type of movie so i think we could get that for sure yeah I, yeah just the illuminati uh, illuminati element of it all too like nobody played the gotham knights game but that was pretty sick you know and i mean obviously <laughs> the comics way better but yeah that idea is pretty dope i yeah I, I don't know man i i'm curious to see what they do it looks like there's a little bit of a time uh jump in there too i don't know who that girl is screaming in it but she seems important, but she also kind of looks like a young cat woman to me. So I'm like, I don't know if they're going that way, but it'll be interesting. I'm on board. I love Matt Reeves. Yeah. Is it a prequel or after? I'm not entirely sure. Probably prequel as he like rises to power, but in the Batman, he doesn't seem like he's powerful enough yet. So I'm not too sure which way we're going. Yeah. He's got the iceberg lounge and I mean, he's got all the politicians in there. So I don't know if that's as powerful as he needs to be, but yeah, yeah they, I'm on board. You guys sold me. At the end, I want him to say, like, the Kingpin thing, like, I'm running for mayor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That would be so cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Any final thoughts on this before we wrap up the five? It looks great. It looks good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just ready for it. Yeah. I, it's, it's just, I am telling you guys, DC, ooh, this new era. I'm so excited for it. I know this part of the old world, but the, the fact that, get, that James Gunn's keeping the Elseworld stuff, I'm so mm-hmm. for Yeah. I hope, I hope this becomes a popular thing and they make more villain-based movies and series. Yeah. That's such an interesting take, dope. man. Like, I, yeah, I, I like am not the biggest person on like, I need to know all the stories for my villains. But yeah, you're right. Like in DC, they've done a really good job with it. So I'm mm-hmm. not going to like throw it out the window until they make a bad movie. They've all, they've made a bunch of good stuff. So I'm on board. I agree with you on that, Thomas, except for when you say Batman villains specifically, all our heroes that just took a wrong turn in comparison to our hero. So Batman is a villain that just we're riding, we're siding with really. He's a billionaire that's punching poor people at night, but um, <laughs> all the, all the other ones yeah, like Vigilante justice. Yeah. Well think of how close Riddler is. Even in the Batman movie, Riddler thinks he's kind of the good guy. He's getting out of yeah. corruption and like Mr. Freeze is the guy that we're going to use. Jonathan, I'm sure you on the t- tip of your tongue. He's trying to save his wife. You know what I'm right. saying? Like every mm-hmm. villain in Batman, except for Joker, which is why Joker's Joker is like so close to being the good guy. And even Penguin's like, he's keeping things honest in, a, in the scummiest places. It's such an interesting... God, I freaking love Batman. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Great yeah. points. Back to the Wheel of Review, guys. All right, we're doing Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice next. And the person leading the way is... It is Jonathan. There we go. <laughs> Just makes sense. All right, Jonathan. You're going to be leading the way for All Beetlejuice, right. Beetlejuice. Go for it. All right, so we saw the trailer for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Uh, it looks really good. I'm excited to see it, honestly. I love that they used that same song from the first one. That's, you know, as soon as you hear it, that's the only thing I've ever heard that song associated with. Uh, but then, you know, killer cast, they're bringing back everybody. And they have uh, Jenna Ortega as the kind of the main character in this one now. Um, I, I don't know what, I mean, it looks like they're doing it right. They're doing very good uh, attention to detail so far. We can see in the CGI and stuff, it doesn't look cheesy which there's definitely scenes in the original one that are a little cringy you can tell i mean when he's in the snake form and stuff like that that's a little too uh yeah that was cringe, stop motion at the, time. Yeah, at the time yeah 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 uh, but yeah this looks so much better 
Um, what, what else? There's Willem Dafoe is going to be in it, which I don't remember. He's, he plays a he's going to play uh, an undead sheriff or detective. That's you're what right, it was. detective. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. He's he's just an amazing actor. Um, you know, they brought back Winona Ryder and Michael Keaton. It's just all around great cast. Um, I don't know. It looks really good. What do you, what do you guys think? The practical effects is kind of something that works really well for Beetlejuice because it's like practical effect. It's okay if it looks cheap because it's kind of the, the, the look of the franchise is kind of cheap mm-hmm. and like just extra green lights on stuff. Um, and then I also like the fact that Michael Keaton being old isn't terribly bad because he's just a rotten yeah. dead guy. So it's like, yeah, he's just yeah. more that. So it works really <laughs> well. Even the final shot yeah. of the trailer is like a close up on him. And you're like, he's definitely older now. But you're also like, he's just more Beetlejuice. <laughs> so I love when they're able to use practical effects like that. Like you're saying, uh, they're they're pretty much timeless. They don't age like CGI does. You know, our technology may keep in, improving, but the paint you actually put on someone's face is still going to look the same. So yeah. as long as they put good attention to detail, it's really nice when they're able to fit that in. Yeah. By now, they probably took all the lead out of the paint, so they're probably gr- golden, you know? That's probably yeah. good to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just like I, Tim Burton and Jenna Ortega. This is like a powerhouse mm-hmm. new combo. Didn't know mm-hmm. that was going to be a thing, and it is Wednesday in the Beetlejuice. And I agree with you. Like the cast <laughs> is just perfect. It, it it seemed like a teaser in the fact that it's just like a little bit of of the intrigue. It gives you the vibe, but it doesn't really tell you what's going on in the story. And I'm on board with that. You only get mm-hmm. Michael Keaton really at the end of it. And it's like, that's all I need. I'm like, I know we're getting Beetlejuice. I I know Michael Keaton's back. I know the whole cast is back. Plus you throw in a powerhouse like Jenna Ortega. This is going to be fun. So yeah, I'm super on board. I also, I I need to be challenged to it because I kind of forget the first one. Like it's been so long since I've watched the original Beetlejuice. I don't really remember everything. So that's going to be a fun challenge to kind of refresh myself going into this new movie. Definitely doing that. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for it because it's it's such a a good pop culture movie. Like it's such a well, you know, everybody knows it, even though it probably didn't. It might not have done great in the box office when it first came out. Uh, but I'm wondering what other movies like that we can see next. You know, like everybody associated with this movie is Edward Scissorhands is also a really good you know cult classic. Could could you not see them remake that now? They're doing too? it with that Ghostbusters. Amazing, We're right? about to review that one, but Ghostbusters is one. Oh of them. yeah, oh god, right, exactly. Yeah. They're doing a great job with that. Yeah, I, so I think Edward Scissorhands is a great call out, though. I'm like, what? That movie yeah. seems right for a, a part two or anything, but yeah. yeah. And and now that Johnny Depp's free, I think you could probably get him yeah. back. You know, with the right yeah. amount of money, so that'd oh, be that'd sweet. Be so cool. These kind of like really late sequels are so far nailing it pretty well. I think I haven't seen. Too many that, that were flops, so I'm excited to keep seeing that happen. Uh, I want to. What do you guys think about the way that they did the, um, like especially the music in the trailer? Because I think like for people maybe who didn't know Beetlejuice, might have been surprised because it seemed like a horror trailer, mm-hmm. right? It's like it has that song we yeah. all know, but it's not song at the same pace. It's not by the same artist. Instead, it's really like creepy, like doll sound or something like that. And then Michael <laughs> Keaton pops up at the end. And you're like, okay, kind of a comedy. We all know this is a full on comedy that just has wacky scare effects, but it's not really a scary movie. I don't know. I thought it was interesting that they kind of a horror for it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think it's marketed to people who haven't seen the original one. It doesn't seem like a very broad audience uh, trailer. Yeah. Like you're saying, like you have to know what you're looking at to understand it, I think. True. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I do think there is a big section of the people that are going to watch it that watch it when they were younger and were scared a lot of those parts. And that's why I'm like, man, they're setting this up pretty good because it does seem like, ooh, it's spooky. But then, gotcha. It makes the joke yeah. at the end where yeah. he pops out like even better, you know. And uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think this was, yeah, there's going to be some people who are, want that, you know, like horror comedies yeah. are awesome. You guys just talked about Ghostbusters. It's like a perfect example at that time. As funny as it was, it probably scared the crap out of a lot of people with the special effects and the way those like gargoyles came to life and yeah, yeah I don't know. So Gozier looks scary. I remember Gozier being kind of scary as much as I loved it <laughs> as a kid, Gozier himself, like he had these eyes, like he'd look down like this. Like, yeah, ah, yeah. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think they're, I think they're nailing with it. The song choice is always on point. Um, Tim Burton seems to do a really good job with that. Like just going back to Wednesday, there's so many really good song choices or like yep. different renditions of popular songs, but done in this very eerie Gothic way. He, he's the master of, of that genre. One of those songs is in my rotation right now. That's on that playlist. Like mentioning that has like 
Loki and the Batman and stuff like that. It's one of the songs from that song, that movie or show too, as well. There oh, you man. go. Vibes. Yeah. Movie vibes. vibes. <laughs> uh, all right. Any last thoughts before we move on to the next one? I nope. think we're good. Okay. Nope. <laughs> we're spinning the wheel of reviews. All right, we have our first full-length review now with X-Men 97. And let's see who's going to start us off. And I hope it's Jonathan who doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> yeah, I do too, actually. I don't want to go first on this. <laughs> oh, man. I did watch X-Men 97. Though. Oh, I thought you didn't. Oh, okay. No, I have. Oh, okay. Oh, it's a, the two. I mean, not that I remember any of it, but, you know, I watched it. What? Right, it's Blasphemy. my first. So we get to do 10 minutes on this because it's a full, you know, it's a series. All right, Oops. here we go. Oh, holy shit. <laughs> it's so good. Um, I This has made me excited for X-Men again. I already was a fan of X-Men, of course, but like to be invested again and this double down on it. Uh, I like how it really knew what the fans were missing, as in like Cyclops didn't get the due diligence he does. Storm wasn't as powerful like she didn't. You know, they made sure that all that was answered. And then they're also fleshing out the Magneto character in this in a way that I think um, maybe the kids that watched it didn't realize. But as adults, when we started watching the movies, we started to learn about Magneto through Gandalf's eyes. And then we were like, oh, okay, he's much bigger than he is, you know. And now they're like, okay, now let's go back to the animation to show you that, yeah, he is bigger than that. Um, that's really cool. Uh, combat in animation has not looked this good. Like, it's hard to think of us. It's like anime level, right? We all know the Cyclops drop. He did amazing but his movements when he's moving around. Um, but even just like the entrance of storm, when they have the Omega threat level, that entrance is so cool. And speaking to that, the music choices everywhere was cinematic and it was specifically targeting your emotions and making sure you felt like the hollow emptiness of the desert. And then she comes in and starts turning it to glass as she walks. And it's like, I, I have no bad notes on the first two episodes of X-Men 97. What are some of your guys' thoughts? Thomas, let's go ahead and let you just start going crazy, man. Really? No, I want I want to hear John first because I want to okay. hear like him coming yeah. in because uh, <laughs> I'm about to drop a nuke on this thing. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, go for it, John. No, I thought it was pretty cool. I just like how they set everything up where it's like, unfortunately, you know, P Professor Xavier died, but then uh, Magneto steps in and is like, you know, going to take over. Uh, but then it's, you know, right away you think, oh, okay, maybe he can play the professor X role of being like the good guy and just lead the X-Men. And it's like, Oh no, humanity doesn't want to make peace. So, okay. Now he's got to lead them in a potentially a war against, you know, humanity or, or fight that battle that he kind of, we always knew he wanted to fight anyways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it looks really cool. I'm glad they set it up this way. I'm excited about it. Uh, um, one thing though about storm, I, I love to see how she came in with all that power, but I've, I, she's an Omega level mutant, but I never, was a huge storm fan. And I realized in this show why I was never a huge uh, fan of hers. And I think it's cause she doesn't have her, uh, any precision in her powers. Mm. So when she's fighting, she can bring in, you know, a thousand mile an hour winds, but she's going to take out the whole town. She can bring down lightning and it's going to make an explosion on the ground. But you know, she doesn't have that. Like, you know, Wolverine can put a single blade through a person's eye and not hit their nose or yeah. whatever, you know, I don't know all these other all these other mutants have, you know, some of them have real precise uh, abilities and hers just seems a little like, like she doesn't have enough control over it. I think. Yeah. So I don't like know. bringing a, a grenade to a driving range or yeah, a shooting range. You're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> real quick on the storm thing. I think one of the things too, that kind of makes it, she is very cool, but not cool as a kid, especially is while you have mm -hmm. like Wolverine jumping onto a, a, a Sentinel or, or like we saw with Cyclops dashing around she just always has this pose, like bringing the storm now. And then things happen around her. <laughs> She's not doing yeah. cool acrobatics or dodging or anything like that. She's just like being cool. Yeah. So I think as a kid, when you're trying to play with the action figures, you're like, here's my storm figure. Okay. She's doing her thing. Now you, you know, it's yeah, yeah. Fun. now someone comes in and punches and, that guy or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's something they could depict differently. They can show her, you know, not, I don't think she should be uh, forcing lightning through her arms. Cause it comes from the sky but pick a target and the lightning strikes that specifically from the sky that she was focusing on. Like that would make a little more sense yeah. or to be able to like channel the tornado into just lift a, a tank instead of like, I, I don't know, just being able to control yeah. it a little more precisely. Like, like in the movie, she killed, I think she killed a uh, toad um, by like what channeling happened? the lightning down the lightning and then threw her yeah. Then yeah. at him. And then he went flying off. 
Hey, so hey, it Frank, can be done. Hey, it's just not done often. What what happens when um, lightning hits uh, something? Yeah, it was a cheesy. Thing that happens it was, to everything else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah. she says. Holly Bear, God bless her. She did not deliver that line too well, in my opinion. But yeah. it was a terrible line to start. I blame the writers on that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's fair. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah just to like, I, I agree with you. When I was a kid, I wasn't the the biggest Storm fan. And as I've gotten older and I've read way more stuff, man, have she has she gotten to like one of the top of my list? Like mm -hmm. she comes from royalty. I mean, the way Magneto gives her credit in episode two is just yeah. like phenomenal. Um, I there's a little bit of pushback. I think in the first episode when they're in that uh, Friends of Humanity room and they're trying to save Rob Roberto, um, and she's shooting the lighting and stuff. She's kind of like directing it right at the guys, and and I'm like, okay, she. I feel like she can control any type of elemental thing. She's almost like the Avatar in a sense where mm -hmm. she can kind of create the conditions for a lightning storm pretty much from her hands. So I think we get to see it a little bit more. I would agree with you though. In like the animated series, I don't think they did as good of a job, but yeah. calling back to the animated series, we got the Morlocks in episode two. Um, if you go back to, I think it was like season three of the animated series. She becomes like the queen of the Morlocks. What's that? It's a season one. She does that. Yeah. Is it season one? She oh, uses the, 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 the like lightsaber. That's the lightsaber, lightsaber bows. Yeah. 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 <laughs> she went Darth Maul, but like she's a super good hand to hand combatant. And I think that's what they were trying to show there. Um, now with her, can we get into spoilers? Go for it. Okay. Spoiler alert uh, for episode two. Now with her powers getting taken away, we have to see her use some of that. Like, is she really smart? Like, What's her ingenuity like? Uh, you know, what can she do with just her bare hands? And I think it's still so fascinating. She's never been afraid of a storm. She's now afraid of it for the first time, which yeah. I think they perfectly captured that moment in the room. But um, we're going to see her have to like learn who she is without her powers. And she's still a badass. So I'm really excited that they've gone with that path. It's straight from the comics. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to go into some other things, unless you guys have some other things to say about storm. Uh, I was just going to, oh, well, I, I, well, I just want to say real quick on storm. Yeah. I hope that we see her kind of go back to um, maybe her thief life or her Wakanda life that I don't know if she was going back to that, but we did see that she has a panda behind or a panther behind her in one scene. So she probably has been there already, but um, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff about storm. That's not X-Men that is super cool. And I would like for them to use this time to explore some of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so Meg, I want to see, oh, sorry, go for it. John. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I think in the movies, doesn't she, her and Beast are kind of the ones that are more into politics too, to try to fight for like mutant rights and stuff like that. So it would be kind of cool to see her now that she doesn't have her powers, she's still going to be fighting for mutant rights and their freedoms and stuff like that by leaning into her political, you know, strengths or whatever. Yeah. I, can see that. I feel so called out because Storm was the one where I didn't read her run on getting depowered and everything. But next week, let me know because I'll come back with all that knowledge. I know about Madeline right. Pryor now. I know about all the time Cyclops uses optic blast to slow his descent or move around uh, all that stuff. Super legit from the comics for the last 50 years. So don't be coming at me with none of that BS, um, but Magneto. OK, so now we get Magneto taking over from episode one. And I love it because we have also seen this in the comics, but it's it's a different dichotomy of of how he approaches leadership and mutants integrating with humankind. We're like. Professor X, as most of the people know who list, or who are listening to this, it's like, we got to work with them. We're going to be on the same side. Right. Magneto is always like, I'm going to crush them because we're, you know, homo superiors. We're better than humans. We should be in charge of them, not like submit to them or like try to integrate. But he also is trying to honor his best friend. And his best yeah. friend said, hey, the X-Men's goal was always for us to stand foot in foot with the humans, to be seen as equals, you know, for them not to oppress us and for us not to try to dominate them. And it's really cool because it's also pulling something from the comics, which is Cyclops leadership with Magneto being in charge. And it's two people. Cyclops completely embodies the ideology of Professor X. And yet, you know, and then Magneto does it. So they're naturally going to butt heads. And we see in episode one, him and, you know, Gene, I put in Gene in quotes, yeah. we're going to yeah, exactly, go away. Yeah. And now it's like they... You know, he has to stick around because he's like, I'm not going to let Magneto manipulate the rest of the team. Like, I got to make sh I got to be here to make sure that they're all OK, which, again, straight from the comics after I think it was like 
X-Men 200, which was the trial of Magneto, all of this kind of, it seems like they're pulling from this time period of the comics where Chris Claremont was just cooking. He was like, all right, uh, Professor X is gone. Gene's out. Uh, you know, Cyclops is trying to get away from the team. Him and Madeline Pryor, or he meets her in Alaska, he's going to retire. But now it's like we get what's happening in episode two. And instantly it's like, oh, shit, they're really going with the true Cable origin, which is wild because that story is so crazy. I assume Cable's coming back then. We have to have Cable come back if we're going to introduce baby Cable at this point. And then do you think they're going Madeline Pryor or will they soft shoe this and go, oh, that's just Gene. Don't worry about it. It's 100 percent Madeline Pryor. I I put money on it. And, and this is why we saw some concept art at San Diego Comic-Con. I want to say it was last year, two years ago of Sinister. And if you know about the comics, Sinister yeah. has everything to do with Madeline Pryor's origin. Mm-hmm. So Sinister, Madeline Pryor, techno-organic virus with cable. Like, I think it's all there. And man, I'm just like so excited that they're going for this because it's a pretty dark story with Madeline Pryor. She is a pretty messed up origin and kind of, her pivotal stories in the comics have been really rough for her. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's going to be madness. Uh, the combat, though, I want to say this. We talked about it on Challenge Accepted, but the synergy attacks of, like, mutants pa- yes. using both of their powers in tandem, bro, give me that all day. Like, Morph turning <laughs> into Blob or a Psylocke or a Colossus, which, by the way, I didn't know he could create weapons. So that was pretty wild, but that's I think new because that shouldn't I, I have never heard that before. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But man, synergy attacks all day. All right. So we're at the end of our 10 minutes for that already. That was fast. <laughs> yeah, it was. Not um, enough time for me. Listen to Challenge Accepted, okay? There it is. So guys, we're gonna be reviewing every single episode of X-Men over on Challenge Accepted. We just finished Halo. And um, it's so much fun doing this, guys. We really get to dive into it. There's so many little nuances and changes in the season that you don't catch unless you're actually analyzing every single episode. Um, so go join us over there. And if you're watching a past show like Avatar The Last Airbender, you could watch along with us, and it's a lot of fun. So go to Challenge Accepted. Link in the description. All right. Uh, let Final thoughts on X-Men before we move forward. Jonathan, anything? No? No. Super stoked. It was good. Yeah. I'm going to keep up with it. One million out of ten. He's the confirmed villain, by the way, for the whole season. So he's going to definitely be popping no up worries. more in the future. As much as we talked about Storm too, I'm like, if there was a, a new movie coming out that was a Storm, you know, origin story, that'd be pretty cool. That'd be dope. Be down to see that. Oh man, when she's on the streets with Gambit, it is so freaking cool, man. Mm-hmm. It is so dope. Yeah. Build up, do do like an Avengers style build up with each of these uh, X Men characters, show their backstory and how they kind of meet each other and stuff, and then you know, go full fledged into a new X Men uh, live action series or, or live action. You know, I'm, movies. I'm sending you a really list cool. of like my favorite storm comics. So get okay, ready. Yeah. I'm about to like drop it <laughs> yes. in there. Cause yeah, she's a beast in the comics. Beast. Yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> all right guys. Time for the wheel of reviews. Spin it now. And we're moving on to the trailer for house of the dragon green and black together. Okay. And the person that's going to be doing this is Jonathan. You're starting us off on this one, man. Take it away now. All right. So House of the Dragons, green and black trailers. I love first off that they did the two separate trailers to show the two, you know, factions or perspectives or whatever. Uh, The black obviously is Rhaenyra and she's, you know, planning on taking back the throne from her, of her dad, from her cousin, I guess. Brother. Right. Cousin and nephew. Brother brother yeah oh yeah yeah step-brother. stepbrother right okay that's what it is anyways uh and then so it's you know her perspective of pretty much you know we have to do whatever it takes all out war we're gonna go take back what's right ours and then uh the green trailer which was kind of cool that it was a perspective of of the mom allison. God, i can't remember her name allison hightower yeah um who you know made sure that her son took the throne after her husband passed uh you know kind of manipulated the the her way in there kind of thing. And so it's her perspective of like, I have to do what I have to do to make sure that our family stays strong and, you know, we're all united and blah, blah, blah. Um, and they're pretty much getting ready for war also, but we're starting to see even just in this trailer, uh, that Eamon's, um, uh, perspective yeah. or his character is, is developing a lot more. And, we knew him as just like this innocent little kid that's getting pushed into the throne. And now we're starting to barely see that, oh yeah, no, he's not ready for the power and he's going to be 
a little Hellraiser out there just burning people. So uh, that looks, I'm excited. I'm ready for that. So <laughs> pretty much. You talk, I, I think you're talking about King Aegon. Um, Aegon, yeah, no sorry. Yeah. There is Aemon though. Uh, but yeah, so yeah. Aegon, they're definitely going to be developing more. And he's going to get kind of that Joffrey treatment. I think we're mm-hmm. all going to hate him plenty. Yeah. And, yeah. um, but it's too, it's too young with too much power. That happens almost you exactly know, every situation. But the one that rightfully should have it is Aemon because he's the one that actually studied to be king. He's the one that's scholarly that's and the best of the sort. He's kind of just like uh, he, he should have a comic book all his own kind of guy. And mm. I love how how much he's going to be carrying the green. We also have that Kristen dude. Um, I think his name's Kristen or whatever. He's he's the real wiener. And he's like, I don't have him. on Sir Kristen or something. Yeah, um, man. I just don't like him. <laughs> he's because yeah, he switched he's, sides so fast. He was Team Black essentially. He switched sides, but um, yeah, I like how much Kristen Green Cole. is going to be leaning in on Aim and being like their champion. And of course, he's riding Vagar, the biggest, baddest ass dragon out there. So that's just a really good one-two yeah. punch. Now over on the Black side, uh, they're definitely war heavy, but like everybody has the person whispering in the air. So we have um, mm. Damon whispering in Rhaenyra's ear. But we have a uh, high tower, auto high tower, whispering in his daughter's ear, Allison. So we have that going mm-hmm. on. We also have the war veterans. We have different aspects of each side, and it kind of reminds me, like with Game of Thrones, if from the beginning, um, Cersei had a better uh, alliance around her to match Daenerys's, mm-hmm. it would have felt good to see these two alliances build up. But it felt like Cersei, because she was such a lunatic, she kept pushing aside a lot of people that would be valuable to her, like her dad, and. So this shows giving us that, like, let them both have good mm-hmm. allies and see who rises at the top. And uh, boy, guys, this is going to be fun. And I especially like the marketing where they're really pitching team versus team. And mm-hmm. we all know based off of Game of Thrones who wins this war, but it's going to be a bloodbath until then. I mean, it worked for yeah. Twilight. So why wouldn't they do it for Game of Thrones? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like we were just talking about with Netflix, like it's fun when, when the, you know, studio or whatever puts a little fanfare and it gets you invested before it comes out you know it's just a bunch of hype totally so yeah i i can't speak to any of the knowledge that you guys have i, I got a drop in like you guys have a well but i'm just speaking to the vibes of it man like uh, it just it's game of thrones does something special with the tension and the characters like every person they cast it just feels like they're they should win an oscar like i don't know why yeah. they all seem so amazing and even the kids and uh, the, like the two queens in charge of this, both phenomenal actors, actresses or actors in their own right. And uh, yeah, it just seems seems like it's going to be crazy. Now, the way last season ended, I, my jaw was on the ground. Um, yeah. I'm fully team black. And yet I like the green trailer more. It felt like it built more of a story. And you're kind of understanding the motivations of that side. You know, I think it, it did a better job of, of explaining that. But I, I got to go with Team Black, so let's see if this yeah. season can change my mind. I'm Team Black as well. Jonathan, which side are you on? Yeah, I mean, you got to be Team Black, right? But I can't I wait for the one-on-ones. <laughs> like, I can't wait for the day that Damon and Eamon can go toe-to-toe with swords. I think that would be cool. And I can't wait for, like, um, there's, I, there's a bunch of them. But, like, if, I, if we get the sea mm-hmm. stake going against Otto Hightower, sword to sword, something like that. Or, or actually, they would go, like, debate-debate. Like, I can't wait for these one-on-ones. That's going to be a lot of fun to, to flush out. You know what I'm hoping for is, I imagine most everybody who's seen Game of Thrones and knows kind of how the story's going to go, or more or less, they probably default to Team Black. I want to see them win you over to Team Green. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, make you really like, oh, no, this should be this way. And then there's a curve where it starts to, you know, turn back and, you know, more is revealed. That would be a lot of fun to take you on Dude, that Dude, I completely agree. It's so right. Mm-hmm. And that's all Allison, Jonathan, because um, one thing I've mentioned it 500 times as I'm editing the last season and <laughs> caught myself doing it. One thing that's really great about this series is unlike other things where the book is the source code and then the show is based off the book. George R. R. Martin said the book is based off of people telling each other the stories. It's, it's uh, three different people writing the book basically for the book on this. And then the mm-hmm. show is actually what happened. So we don't have any bias of, what, of when people are writing the story. For example, in the book that this is based off of, um, there's a lot of like, oh, this guy was against the church, but he was misguided. And that's because it was written by one of the basically priests. We'll go with that, a maester. But um, so it's like, oh, yeah, of course he's going to say that he was misguided because he's working for the church. The show's going to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. And in the show, it showed that Allison actually does believe, and for good reasons, that her son is the rightful king because that's actually what 
the king wanted. And so, and in the book, it just seemed like, oh, she's just being greedy. No, she thinks she's fighting for her, for her good son, you know? And I love that. that they're husband. actually making, well, yeah. And, and um, they're making Allison kind of this person that you're like, I want the greens to lose, but like Allison is a nice person. I don't want her to necessarily lose with him. Her father could fucking die in a fire, but there's a good person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Any final thoughts on house of the dragon before we go back to the wheel? It's uh, it's super soaked. hyped. Yeah. <laughs> super hyped. Yeah. You're going to take me to school in June. We're going to go every episode of that on challenges as well. Jonathan, of course you're welcome on every one of those episodes. If you'd like to join us. Yeah. I hope they release some, uh, some early merch too. Like, you know, you guys talking about movie buckets and st- uh, popcorn buckets for certain yeah. movies and stuff like that. I know this is going to be, you know, on it on Max, but they should be releasing something like that that I can have while I'm watching. I don't need it. a popcorn bucket that's going to turn me on though. So AMC, kind of keep that in mind. <laughs> the Dune popcorn bucket had me feeling weird. So let's not do that again. <laughs> Extra butter, Going back please. to the yeah. wheel of reviews. Congratulations <laughs> to Kyle, by the way, on that one. Yeah. Oh, good. All right, we're going to Ghostbusters, another 10-minute one. Let's see who's kicking this off. All right, John, then here we go. Tell us about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. All right. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Really good movie. Just watched it today. Um, I like it had you know, most of the same cast that was in uh, Afterlife. The Afterlife. There you go. Uh, which I hadn't seen until earlier this Crazy. year. I think in January I, I watched That's- it. I, I, and I loved it. It was really good. I just, I don't know why I never came around, went around, got around to watching it. Um, so it was just an all around good movie. Like the, you know, good, uh, technology they use CGI and stuff like that. And how they use the, uh, drone, uh, trap, the trap, uh, ghost catcher. I want to throw it yeah. quick. Keep it spoiler free. Cause we're going, we're, this is the week of the premiere. So just keep it, keep it with spoiler free. Okay. Yeah. How, how do you so feel we'll just, about yeah, the cast? Stuff. Like, did you think the cast worked as well this time around? Yeah, I think it was mostly the same cast as Afterlife. A uh, few added characters that were a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, I think it was perfect. It's even, it's it's nice to see the kids growing up. Yeah. You think like, oh, you know, it kind of ruins the, the age that they're supposed to be. But no, I mean, kids are going to grow. And, you know, now like the son is the young adult who's, you know, learning how to drive and stuff like that. And they, I like how they kind of play with that and make it fun in the movie. Yeah, and even the um, little girl and, in the yeah. last one is now a teenager with romantic interest in this one. Like they've aged mm, up yeah. respectfully. Yeah. She's yeah. like reminds yeah. me of Reed Richards. So she probably is like, I don't even know what to do with this romance. You know, like science first, yeah. romantic <laughs> interest accurate, later. Actually. Kind of, yeah. That's yeah. that's yeah, yeah, that's like, true. Yeah. And she's just so brilliant, she like can't contain her genius yeah. and it's sometimes a problem, but yeah. It's uh I, I liked it all. I'm I'm down for more. It so, was simply a fun movie. Like I got to say, when you mentioned the cast mm-hmm. thing, by far the strength is the cast. And there was yeah. a thing when we first stepped out of the theaters, I was telling John, I was like, I like how there was maybe three minutes of Patton Oswalt. And then like a couple minutes yeah. of this guy. It's kind of one of those things where it's Patton like, Oswald. I love him. But <laughs> it's just like, let me just go ahead and join in the Ghostbusters real quick. Cause it's Ghostbusters. Have fun with it. Yeah. They, they do such a great job of making sure that everybody feels naturally in there. There is one mm-hmm. character in this movie, I won't say who or anything like that, that doesn't feel very natural and their contribution to the story is mm-hmm. not very natural. It was a step That's out, true, yeah. but it's not a step out from the animated series, I remember, which is what this one's kind of based off of. So there's that, mm-hmm. but it is Do you th- kind of off from everything else. Mm-hmm. Do you think for that problem it was casting or yeah. a little bit of the writing? I think it was writing. I think it was just kind of like, yeah. um, it's... I keep saying vibe a lot, but it's just perfect for this. It doesn't fit with the vibe of the rest of the Ghostbusters stuff, but it kind of yeah. like technically does because we're talking about fake ghosts being trapped in orbs, you know? So it's like, yeah, yeah, sure. That could be there too. But it's like, yeah, but use a proton pack, not this this type of thing. Yeah. I, I think it was a little too rushed when there's yeah. all this other science and stuff that's already been established. And I know we're not, we're trying to tell, <laughs> tell you about something without telling you about something. So it's keeping it spoiler free, but yeah, this new, element that they added uh they just kind of added a little too fast mm-hmm. i think if there was seeds planted and then we saw them grow it would have made a lot more sense and fit better and been more fun but uh it's just kind of like a, a quick growth and then a, yeah you know, brief out of out. context i'll just say this jonathan how much better would have been if his grandma just taught him how to do it like as a ghost oh i see come back yeah. and then teach him real quick okay yeah I guess that would have been better because it's something that's being passed down like avatar styles, just avatar. <laughs> yeah. And it's very much or like, MB- 
and not even like training, but like imbue him with yeah. the knowledge. Like, you know, she possesses him for a moment and he understands. But the reveal of his mastery was freaking dope. When he was like, guys, yeah. you see, I'm doing this. It's like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay. All right, yeah. let's get... And the, the actor's funny. I like oh, the actor. Oh, speaking of that, I will watch Paul Rudd yeah. freaking read the dictionary. He oh, is so yeah. good at his job. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, he is, he's I mean, and we see in this he's, he's so good. I'm pretty sure he's just like blank check. Yeah. He can get in any role that he wants now. I mean, he's just been out, you know, uh, great movie after great movie. So yeah. lovable. And he, play, he plays himself. He plays, it's, it's, if he all of a sudden shrunk, I'm like, oh, okay, it's Ant-Man. He just had pajamas on. It's the same actor <laughs> playing the same roles, but I just love that actor in those roles. <laughs> and speaking of shrunk, like, I know he did all Ant-Man, but I would love to see him in something like Honey, I Shrunk the Kid. Like, yeah, he's Marinus, a perfect yeah. actor for that kind of movie. You know, right. he's just like that fun sitcom dad now, so... How does it good. feel? Because I'm assuming a lot of the movie is back in New York. Is that a pretty yeah. cool change mm-hmm. from the city they were yes. in? Yes. Oh my God. And mm-hmm. that is so yeah. freaking Ghostbusters, man. When, you, when you're back <laughs> in New York and more importantly, like especially somebody who grew up on these movies, hearing that siren again, echoing <laughs> off the buildings and as they're chasing a ghost down, you're just like, oh, we're back, baby. But yeah, when you have the new cast and the old cast, we talked about this uh, in the past where Ghostbusters is nailing the nostalgia that everybody else is trying to capture. And they just have to fix this, uh, uh, fit this format as well. And they added a lot of new characters to this one. One of them was James Acaster, a comedian I really liked. But his mm-hmm. role in this, I mean, he's really actually playing himself as well, if you guys know James Acaster. But he was like a cool addition that was kind of like this wisecracking, no better than actually the Ghostbusters about ghosts. That worked well for this. I mean, there's just so many little added people that worked really well. And the story mm-hmm. itself is serviceable. I would say the story is good, not like going to be stellar, but it's one of those things where it's just like, give me a reason to watch these people do things and I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't require a real heavy story or anything like that. Yeah. what do you think about the bad guy, Jonathan? Um, it was, it was good enough. I, I like the, the lore. I like that it was kind of, you know, uh, from a millennia ago mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, but we didn't see a whole lot of him. Yeah. He wasn't like, you know, Hand, you know, no hand to hand combat or him moving much or anything like that. He's always just kind of in more or less the same pose and reaching forward Very and much stuff. Like so, storm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah, his power is not necessarily contact, uh, but he was, he was looked creepy. You know, I think he did the job as a scary ghost. They, so. they show him his face a lot more than they do in the trailer. So, I know in the trailer, he's kind of like ambiguous. In the, in the mm-hmm. movie, you see his face a lot more and, and it, it makes more sense yeah. and stuff. Um, they do a lot of lore building in this in a in a way that you'd expect from like again the cartoon where it's like oh really cool lore area next movie we're gonna go to a whole another corner you'll never have to hear about any of that lore again and it's just building up this wider world that you don't have to really dig into. One thing I think they could have done to build up that villain a little bit is at one point you do hear him you hear his voice without yeah. seeing him like I think when he was inside the orb still or something like that. Uh, so. And the, his power to some extent is that you don't necessarily freeze to death, but you die of fear, mm-hmm. right? Die of, freeze to know, death. Uh, yeah. 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 You die of fear and then you, you get frozen. Yeah. But so if he could play a little more into that psychological thriller side of it and whenever he's around, people are hearing whispers or something mm-hmm. like that. I think that would have been cool to kind of build that fear in us of him that, you know, yeah, he's, it's more of a psychological threat than just a ice spike is going to get you kind of well, Kind of the problem with that, John, is the Beetlejuice problem. Where is it a comedy or is it a horror film? So you kind of have to be. Oh yeah, go horror. Let's lean into right. the horror. If you want to lean into the horror, <laughs> yeah, then, yeah, I know. And those. And I think in Stranger Things, mind those flare spikes would have gone all the way through. There's a lot of times where the spikes are right here. It's like no, go a little bit further if it's a horror movie. Then yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, all around a totally fun movie, and I think you could take your kids. They're not going to be totally freaked out. There are ghosts, of course, but there's also Slimer who's just eating. Like there's a sub entire subplot about. Um, the Stranger Things kid trying to trap Slimer, who's just been like the mo- yeah. mascot of the series, and uh, you could cut <laughs> it out; would not affect anything. It all it does is serve as a joke later on. He's like, "I know that guy," and that made me laugh. <laughs> you know what? I I honestly think you and me were laughing pretty good through this movie too. Like the jokes actually held yeah. up pretty well. Yeah, I felt kind of bad for the people in front of us. Like, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> we're laughing too much back yeah. here. But that was. Pretty I good. wonder if people who don't know the original. No, I I just think the I think the jokes are all all better than it was better than. We just did Men in Tights, and I was like, man, I'm really not laughing at any of these jokes right now. But these ones don't work. Yeah. Thomas, do you have any questions about this? Um, not beyond the ones I asked. I mean, I think you guys yeah. answered it all. I, I can't wait to see this cast again. Loved them in Afterlife. Can't wait to see 
the new addition of characters, like I, I wonder how that's going to work. Cause it seemed like a big cast in the last movie. So it's like, yeah. you're throwing even more characters in there. That seems a little crazy. Also, I think I saw Kamal Nanjiani with like some frosted tips. So that seems like a win. <laughs> That's a character um, we're trying not to talk about right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, we'll see. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm on board, man. It looks fun. Um, talk about popcorn buckets. That bucket looks cool too. We should yes. probably give mm-hmm. some of those away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But man, I'm super on board. I love Paul Rudd. Let's go. When you watch it, let me know. Yeah. I want to make sure to record a challenge except for it. And I and again, it's just popcorn. Great, great. It's totally a popcorn flick. Um, I'm personally giving it an eight out of ten, and it's leaning so heavily on just enjoying the ride and not overanalyzing the story and as long as you do that it's an 8 out of 10 comfortably what do you think Jonathan yeah I think I think it's a great fit if you liked the other ones if you don't like this kind of sitcom or or this kind of you know movie that's fine you know it's not going to be for you but if you really did like Afterlife especially this is right in that same lane so totally kind of a uh, welcome to the jungle Jumanji thing like the newer Jumanji's where it's just a you know somewhat family movie stuff like that family friendly what would you what would you grade it or what's your score Jonathan I'd probably at least do 8.5. Wow. Yeah, it's 8.5. Yeah. High scores. Yeah. Because because the yeah. thing is, is you yeah. walk out of the theater happy with what you just saw. Like, it's so hard to do that sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll go see a movie. I'm like, yeah, this deserves a 10. But man, I'm depressed as hell. Oppenheimer. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something right. like that. Yeah. True. Oh, God. Yep. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. That is it for our Ghostbusters review. And uh, I think 10 minutes is pretty good. We'll have to remember that for the future. Because sometimes we go ham on a review and it gets carried away. <laughs> we're headed back to the wheel of review and we've only got two more options left guys i don't even remember what they are <laughs> you're gonna be surprised all right <laughs> we're going to the trailer for 1943 rise of hydra and then our person starting things off is me all right so we're talking 1943 the rise of hydra and this is going to be a video game set in a marvel world in the middle of world war ii uh we have of course a a black panther of the time but we also have captain america steve rogers before the freeze and it's got espionage and it's got you know uh a france that's in, in siege with the maquis and i always love to say maquis jonathan you know and <laughs> oh yeah it's just so freaking cool uh the motion capture on this though i gotta get uh peyton i can't remember his name but he's the king ezekiel from walking dead is going to be our black panther and as soon as he took off the mask, you're like, oh, that's King Ezekiel because the motion capture is so damn good. And it looks like he's in this game mm-hmm. right now physically. Uh, and, and just the combat and the lighting looks so good. It's one of those games. It kind of reminds me of Jedi Fallen Order and, and Jedi Survivor where I'm just like, I cannot wait to watch that movie. I just have to press the buttons to make it happen. And that's exactly what this is. I'm, I'm looking forward to that story. And if the combat is serviceable, I will be happy. What are your guys thoughts from this trailer? The, to me, the animation looks so good. They could be making movies out of this. And I honestly, I mentioned it before, but after people have played the game and, you know, the cat's out of the bag, they should totally cut these scenes together into, you know, small movie or, you know, series or whatever and just throw it on Disney Plus because why not? Like, you already have the content there and it looks like a really good story that they wrote. So, you know, if people, if some people, certain people aren't, you know, interested in playing the game, you should, you know, give them the story. And then you can also tie it in where, you know, it continues on like they've done with the, you know, going back and forth between the streaming shows and the movies and theaters and stuff like that. So you can have a game that also continues the the MCU storyline. Uh, but, you know, then once people have played it, everybody else can watch it too and not miss out. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, all the cinematics in this thing are incredible. I think it's like Unreal Engine 5 or 4.5 oh, yeah. or something like yeah, that. Mm-hmm. So they're they're going all out with it. Um, yeah, on the cinematics and the story, I mean, we know that Skydance is producing it normally like a movie studio, mm. but I think this, this is, is like their first game. I want to throw that out there. I'm pretty sure this is their first game. That's that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. So on the story, this is why I feel pretty confident. Uh, you know, I listened to another podcast hosted by Kevin Smith and Mark mm. Bernardin called Fat Man Beyond. I love it. It's one of my favorite podcasts of all time. But I think it was like two years ago, Mark said, Hey, I got called in to do this thing for Skydance and I'm like working on this Marvel game. I can't talk about it. And, and he's like, yeah, there's Captain America in it and Black Panther. So when this trailer popped up, I was like, oh, I know exactly what this is. And it's yeah. crazy because I heard about it back then and seeing it now, I'm like, oh my God. He, I love him as a writer. He, he's written some fantastic episodes of all these different shows. Um, yeah. But I think the story is going to be there. I'm just curious about the gameplay. Because this was a completely cinematic trailer. 
Like, mm-hmm. is it just going to be single player story driven? Are there going to be multiplayer elements? Um, from what I've heard about it before, there was supposed to be like a co-op element where you're not just playing as Captain America or Black Panther. You might be able to play as their those two other people that are in the picture with them. Yeah. One is like uh, the uh, Wakandan warrior and one seems to be a soldier with Captain America. So I'm like, all right, are they going to add that in there? I, I don't know. I guess just from a gameplay element, I'm really excited to see what they bring to the table. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a, like a single player story mode, but every it's clear that we have companionship the entire time. So it's going to be probably escort mission-esque type of thing. Somebody for you to constantly be bouncing uh, your dialogue off of when you're about to... So, so that's how you flush out a character to where it, like both sides are right. Because it looks like Captain America and Black Panther are against each other, but they're going to be making their points to the characters that are with them. And then hopefully there's a co-op thing because me and Jonathan, we used to play Halo together and we, now Halo botched it. Mm-hmm. So now we can do this together. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so that you could play with the other person. And if that's the case, then I wonder how the combat's going to feel different because I think arguably Black Panther and uh, Captain America could have very similar super soldier fighting moves except for mm-hmm. one's throwing a shield and they'll give something like that to the other one. But then when you're talking about the Wakandan warrior, spear throw. And then when mm-hmm. you're talking about the soldier gun you know so i i think the companions <laughs> could really mix up the the fighting styles and make it a, a pretty neat uh, difference yeah so. definitely and i think d- the conflict between them is only maybe half the game or less i right. think you know it's them being against each other mm-hmm. not knowing who they are and then by half the game you know they, there's that big battle between them you no know, we're on the same side and then you move forward with like the real story and yeah. i'm assuming at the end of it we see red skull because we wasn't in the trailer at all, but yes. we know that Red Skull has to be the main villain for this time. World War II, the rise of Hydra, it's in the name. Yeah. Like It's going to be great. Yeah, I'm super uh, on board with this. I'm sure he's getting vibranium for a new weapon he's making for the, for the Nazis. Ooh, yeah. that would be yeah, sick. I now yeah. want to read the comic book for this too. <laughs> like, I hope they put a companion comic book out, which I'm sure. <laughs> they're like, hey, Mark, why are you here? But what bust out a comic book that ties to that? You're gonna be buying that. I know you're pulling that oh, on your pill list. Definitely. He just wrote a new Mace Windu run that he that it's, it was a big yeah. deal. Yeah, yeah, that was all him. And I haven't read it yet, but it looks pretty damn good. It looks really good, yeah. Any thoughts, gentlemen? Nope. <laughs> Qu- question <laughs> question good. for you guys though. <laughs> no. Well, this was one thing that kind of stopped me up a little bit. You know, I get like in the weeds about things. Um how did you guys feel about Captain America? Like just the way he looked, did it throw you off at all for a second? Not me, no. He didn't he didn't look much like the Chris Evans Captain well, America? Yes. And that's that's yeah. why for me, I'm like it just threw me okay. off for a second. Where I'm like, all right, that's Captain America, but I'm so like Chris Evans is so Captain America to me now that yeah. when I see somebody in cinematics or almost live action, it's like if they don't look like Chris Evans, I kind of it took me a second. By the end yeah. of the trailer, I'm like, yeah. for sure, that's Captain America. I love the moves, bouncing shield off people, catching it. But there was a split second where I was like, I don't know if that's Cap. <laughs> Who's this? Yeah, imposter? exactly. exactly. Yeah. Just for a split second, but then I was on board. <laughs> Meanwhile, when like I saw Hydra infiltrated, the- <laughs> when I saw <laughs> Carrie Payton as, as Black Panther, I was like, can we get a movie with him as Black Panther too? Because, like, I, right. King Ezekiel, he carried it for so long. And he's even in the finale when the show's dead as a doornail, he's still cool in it. Um, yeah. Carrie Payton's dope. So and John, uh, Squeaks actually met him at a convention and everything like that. And he's got a video with him. I'm like, dude, oh, that's so cool. So yeah, um, I'm looking forward to that. Definitely. You guys ready for the last? It's going to be really easy. I'm going to click the button right now. The wheel spinning, guys. Oh, yeah, it's the same damn thing. We're going to Halo Season 2. Let's see who's going to be oh, starting us off on this. By the way, we did do a review for every episode of Halo on Challenge Accepted. And the finale was pretty spicy. I'm starting off with this one. Um, and we have 10 minutes to review Halo 2. Seize the whole season as a whole. So, when Halo hits, it hits hard, and it was fantastic. The Fall of Reach was a phenomenal episode, and I want to clarify somebody something when if you guys listen to the challenge except of this. Master Chief is not in the video game about Fall of Reach. Uh, he is obviously in the show for it, but he doesn't have his armor the whole mm-hmm. time. And I thought that was a really good move because it showed how good of a soldier John is from the front as a leader, and with the environment around him, with the people around him, how good all the soldiers and the Marines are. Um, but when, when the Halo series falls flat, it falls flat so damn hard it drags down everything around it. When they're going to kill... Spoiler alert, by the way. Spoiler alert real fast for that. Jonathan, I'm sorry. You're bringing it spoiled on this. When you're going to kill the Arbiter oh, yeah. so 
sadly uh-huh. like that, and then basically use McKee to replace him. Uh, you're making it real hard for me to tune in for season three, folks. I'm going to admit that right now. That's a tough one. And then, and we talked about this before. How are they going to do Arbiter's CGI demand yeah. in the show? And it's by putting in this McKee character and replacing him to where he doesn't need to be on screen. That kills me that they're I, doing that. I tell you that. what, yeah. Like, if the Covenant had a Twitter account, they'd call this show racist. Because it's, yeah. it's bullshit that they're using McKee to replace all the Covenant characters who have a diverse culture and a diverse race and everything like that. <laughs> it's bullshit that we have this this white girl that's replacing everybody. You know, yeah. I, I, I would much rather they go the 8472 route and have mm-hmm. some technology that makes the Covenant blend in, look like yeah. humans. You know, and just for certain scenes, and then you know, as they walk away, they switch it off, and you see them Secret transform Invasion just from the too. back yeah, or something. Marvels. Yeah, yeah, like come on, it doesn't take a lot. It just play sense. with us a little bit. Don't, don't ruin it. I don't know. That's the other terrible. thing, the finale fell so damn flat in the, the fact that we've been wanting the flood for a while because it's a big part of the story. And mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So in the final episode, at the very end of the this, the penultimate penultimate episode, they have the flood fully in 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 command. Uh, taking over the ship, zombie attack, yada, yada, yada. And it's like, if you were not a Halo fan and knew the flood was coming, how disjointing is it to be like, worried about the Covenant, worried about corruption within the UNSC, and no collusion, yeah, not, not finishing either of those, all of a sudden zombie attack. Like, make that the start of either season two, or more importantly, the start of season three now that you're finally on the Halo. For so sure. I had many complaints, but I, I want to reiterate that when the show does well, it does phenomenal work combat is so cool the actors i think are doing a solid job pablo especially but yeah it definitely had some very big weak spots totally and they hyped up that final battle with the covenant and putting the spike in so much at over three mm-hmm. episodes and then we right. get there and it's like so quickly washed over because all of a sudden the floods attacking everybody and yeah. you know it's like a zombie attack and it's like wait what what are we supposed to be looking at it felt like whiplash in this last episode yeah. and it's like it's a little unfortunate because this season i felt like they start off so strong those first couple episodes i was like oh man they're True. bringing it this season like you fall breach was happening I, I kind of feel a little weird about him not being in the suit most of the season but i get it it's expensive it's hard whatever but i thought they still did a great job those episodes are incredible and then the the end was like there's again spoiler alert here there were so many main characters that died off in the finale that you're like why did i follow their story this whole season just for it to end kind of so abruptly it with not big payoffs so yeah it was some interesting choices in the finale not just main characters they killed off like a lot of the new characters they invented for this season specifically that they bothered building up they killed off and they kept the characters that they put on ice for a while halsey's daughter they literally just didn't have her in most of the season too then all of a sudden she's back for two episodes and she's the one of the few survivors. And it's like, we don't give a shit about her. She's not, you know, we haven't right. been following her. So why yeah. do we care? You, but you took time to make Soren's wife, just a trophy wife from season one, into a main character, a mom that loves her son and is destined to find him, into killing her off? Like, no, you just developed this character from nothing. So mm-hmm. it's, it's so odd, the choices they decided to make. Yeah. Yep. Jonathan, yeah, any th- questions on the show that we just spoiled for you? Because I know you haven't watched the final episode. Yeah, it sounds so disappointing. I know. I don't think I saw the last two, oh, yeah. maybe. I don't know. I saw a big covenant battle. Uh, a lot of Arbiter, and I guess he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it just sounds so disjointed. That's really, <laughs> really disappointing. And especially the Flood. Like We've talked about it before, how it's such, it, it is what made the game fun. Like It's such a big part of the game, and how much fear it put right. in you and stuff like that. And so we were so excited for it to be just like teased or barely shown or introduced at the end of the season. So it's like, oh my God, I have to wait a whole year to see the flood attack. Like, this is going to be crazy. And it's got to be done like a horror movie. Like, you know, I don't know. Obviously they didn't yeah, though. So I mean, it just they sounds, do do that. I mean, like, but it's a like, lot of suspense. Yeah, it just doesn't time, make though. sense within the, the pacing of the show. You're like, to Frank's point, yeah. they either should have started season three with it or the covenant should have been done in episode seven and then flood episode eight. So it, it's just like, what? I don't know. It was so strange. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, a lot of like, all my favorite characters this season are pretty much dead. So I'm like, I don't know who I'm <laughs> supposed to really be following. I know it's supposed to be John, but they do something even weird with John. Right. And Frank, you were explaining to me who guilty Holy spark shit. was 
Um, but he, he plays a bigger part in this season, but then they do something weird with John's mask. And I'm like, where are we going? Yeah. Also just real quick on guilty spark. They started the, again, season episode three really should have been season three, episode one. It really should have been, if you look at the way it laid out. So, um, but yeah, they did a thing where guilty spark is kind of, uh, interrogating master chief in the beginning of the episode. And in the end you see it's a, it's a drone, but they don't explain who Guilty Spark is. He is a big character. He's basically the Cortana of the Halo. That's simplifying him beyond simplified, but still. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's kind of like, that's a whole character you just introduced and then didn't give any context for and didn't make him interesting enough for anybody to care. Um, and then with Master Chief's helmet, because we have to see Master Chief, we have to see John, I'm sorry, let me correct myself. They cracked his helmet so that you can see through his eye now. And there's no way to fix that on Halo. So. He's going to have that for the whole season, which is, I mean, I just can't think of a worse move because you either have to consistently CGI in a, a live action space or actually make the damn helmet. Just, I don't know what they're going to do. We'll see. Yeah. Why did they not go the Mandalorian <laughs> route just because they didn't want to be compared to that? Like, no, it works. Do that. Yeah. The, the Mandalorian would have been compared gunner. to you. <laughs> I mean, you are, right. you've been around yeah. a lot longer than, than that specific Mandalorian. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's cool to build the character who the guy is behind the mask, but you also want to see him as the guy in the mask that has no, you know, emotion and is methodical and stuff like that. You got to, you know, compare and contrast the two, not just break it to where they're both the same. Yeah, the absolutely. Time. We talked about a lot too, like episode or season one had a lot of like very video game moments. And then mm-hmm. this season doesn't. And that's kind of a let down a little bit too. Like even the sounds or just like different shots, the way they did like POV things with him shooting or reloading or throwing grenades is like they didn't really have that this season. It's like, yeah. no, that was pretty cool. And it it makes you feel like you're in that universe. And uh, I don't know. They they seem like they went away from that a lot this season. I don't yeah. know. It's weird. So we're at the end of our 10 minutes and I want to end things off on a more positive note. I hate to just dog on. It's unfortunate. Halo is It's over. No, <laughs> yeah. So what were some of your favorite parts from the second season of Halo? And I'll, I'll start off with some of the characters they introduced. Ramirez. I don't know if I'm saying the name right. Uh, Perez. Perez. I did the exact same mess up name too. On the challenge yeah. accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Perez was a wonderful character they introduced. And I think is a really good way of showing just your average citizen fighting for their hometown, essentially. I think I think Perez and some of the other characters too, but it is our real highlight for the show. Yeah, yeah Kai mm-hmm. continues to be a standout. I, I love what they did with Riz. I'm like, I want more Riz, but she got to you know sail off in the sunset, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Like all the Spartan stuff was super super cool. Uh, they did build out a different side to the Covenant. I, again, it would have been nice if it was the Arbiter because you would have had these two characters on similar trajectories, but from just different sides. Um, so I think that was pretty cool. And, and the special effects kicked asses, kicked ass this season. Yeah. Like it looked really, really good when it looked. I mean, this, there's so many fights and everything this season that are so badass. And yeah, yeah it, it's I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know. I just wish there was more of that. Specifically, uh, Master Chief yeah. versus Arbiter. That final fight was very dope. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I know I didn't see the whole season. I, I don't even remember. I, which episode I left off probably like episode three or something. <laughs> like that. Uh, but I did see, <laughs> I don't know, but I did see uh, Arbiter seeing the halo for the first time. And that it was just beautiful. I'm glad they took the time to make that look so yeah. good because it was just like, Oh man, I just want to stop and stare. I want to make this my, my screensaver on my desktop mm-hmm. or something like that. Uh, Cause it just looks so good. So yeah, they did, they did good with the CGI. Yeah, and and season three will, will be all of that because now they're on the halo. And, yeah. and they even said like, Season three is the start of the video game. So we're going to get all that we wanted from there. That'd mm-hmm. be good. Um, all right. Let's end things off this episode. Looking back at what we just watched and what we just reviewed. What is your most anticipated thing out of the things that we've learned today? I think House mm-hmm. of Dragons. Yeah, I mean, all the everything Game of Thrones is always satisfied. So I, and it feels like I don't know when's the last time it came out, but it feels like it's been like three years or something. Maybe it's only been one. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely ready for more. I'm going to have to agree with you. I'm going to go with House of the Dragon as well. Uh, it just hits, hits me the right way. It's fantasy. It's big. It's epic. Dragons are dope. Um, and, uh, Mm -hmm. and it's just a cool show. Um, but I also want to throw in 1943, I think is something from Skydance that I haven't seen before, like Skydance doing something new. 
and um, the return of narrative based video games is something that's kind of on the rise, which is nice because we were in the live service game era for a little too long, in my opinion. And the fact that we're getting back to these story based games, um, I'm, I'm excited for so 1943 might be even beating House of the Dragons a little bit. Wow, that's I know. impressive. I'm, I'm excited for it. What now, do you think? I, I got the Acolyte, <laughs> then House of the Dragon, then X Men Episode 3, because <laughs> obvious <laughs> reasons. That, that's where I'm at. Yeah. But uh, all these things look so good. We're, we're in for it. June is going to be an awesome month for us. I mean, it's going to oh be really God. busy for you and me, Frank, but it's going to be an awesome year, and especially June's going to be an awesome month. San Diego Comic-Con in July, too. Oh, my God. What a year. It's going to be great. I know. Oh, God. I almost don't look forward to it. It's cool, but I'm also like, oh, shit. <laughs> we got a lot going on. Um, <laughs> all right. Network-wise, guys, uh, again, Outlast Podcast is coming out with episodes right now, and uh, things are getting heated up. One of our least favorite people just got kicked off, so... It's we're celebrating over there. We're pretty happy. Uh, <laughs> Off the champagne. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> over at uh, Who's Got Next Game podcast, they finished up their PlayStation brackets. Now they're moving on to the next console. They're going to be doing two episodes per console. So join in over there, guys. Um, the next one is Wii. So you guys get to learn about that. I, there's so many games for the Wii I completely forgot about. So I'm excited to, to share those with you guys. <laughs> um, and then a challenge accepted. Our next movie is going to be Congo. We were challenged by Drake, and we're also reviewing every episode of X-Men 97, so check that out. Um, and our next interview is with Alex Schumacher, uh, one of our very, Schumacher, uh, one of our very first interviews. He's back, he's written a new book, and uh, he's going to be telling us all about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's coming out on Friday. All right, guys, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Aloha. Aloha.